So this is a presentation that continues our conversations on um, citizenship and rights in the new Latin American republics. Um, during the previous period, we examined um, the conditions in Mexico and um, the designation of individuals as um, members of different uh, caste systems. So for example, we talked about Espanol, which is um, the uh, peninsularis, this you can actually look at it as peninsularis, so those who came from um, Mex from Spain. Um, we looked at the other designations, so for example, mulatto um, and blacks and moriscos and mestizos. Um, and so Latin America was plagued by this classification of people that sought to um, put them in classes based on race, color, physical features, occupation, and wealth. And of course, you have, for example, India, which is, um, which defines the, um, particularly the um, Indian American peoples. Um, so they, I think you might think of this as the, um, um, the native Indian peoples, uh, but also sort of how Latin America decides to deal with these individuals and peoples and challenges. Um, and so Hispanicization, but also marginalization of um, especially uh, black cities. Um, the, the question was still whether they were citizens of these places. Um, and so systematic victimization with institutional discrimination, conditions that actually approximated those of the um, United States. But there, there's a bit of assimilation, as we shall um, um, later on. Um, and so, the, especially in places like Argentina, these individuals are Hispanicized or classified differently. And so when, when we think about uh, Latin America, we actually begin to see the impacts of um, what I call Euro-Atlantic thinking in bad science, so the science of eugenics. So these ideas that um, often stem from um, the um, Charles Darwin's um, visit to the Galapagos Island and the, his subsequent publication, The Origin of Species, and then it's an adaptation by individuals like Charles, like Herbert Spencer, who you know talks about um, the social application of um, Darwinism, so social Darwinism. So these ideas on biological differences begin to gain um, significant, um, significant import to in Latin America. And so when you you actually see that they are realization in Germany during um, the Second World War when they were practiced against Jews. But it's broader, really, because if you think about the United States and the One Drop Rule and Jim Crow, and all these were based on biological differences among races or perceived or the ideas on the, that are built on, on these ideas. And so the old systems that, um, for example, colonialism, now became a new exclusionary system that is based on race and class and so on. And so eugenics was very uh, important. And so you can see some of the individuals who are quoted on these race ideas of biological differences. So uh, for example, Samuel von Sommering talks about uh, different races descending from different origins. So origin of species may not have been the same but also think about creation. Um, the idea that different groups are innately different abilities by Johann Blumenbach. And is this true? Is it true that there's some things that some people can do and others cannot do? Uh, but also the ideas of uh, the mixing of, lace, of races leading to the degeneration of the species. And so when you think about the purity of race and species, but also when you sort of think about the application of this in the U.S. and in Latin America, in the U.S., perhaps Emmett Till. Um, but also, so the sort of ideas of uh, societal responsibility for maintaining and improving the gene pool 
by Galton. And so the question is, how do you do that? And some people thought it's by eliminating the weaker or the undesirable species. So again, we run, we run into eugenics, uh, phrenology and craniometry. Um, especially craniometry, measuring the, the cranial capacity of individuals. And the Germans were very good at this, especially. And even though they do not do this in Latin America, they do this in Africa with the Nama and the Herero. Um, this is very disturbing um, outcomes of this. And so all of this is, you know, so when you think about um, bad science, eugenics, phrenology, craniometry, they are elements of scientific racism which um, continued the colonial system that favored blood cleanliness, so pure, pure blood. Um, so not having that 1% um, 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 the one drop rule, um, basically. And so when we think about um, what eugenics does for newly independent nations that are multiracial, in some cases having about 20% uh, of um, maybe black population that used to be enslaved, we, we sort of see how this will become challenges to the, um, the new nation. Um, and so you actually find the similar ideas um, as you might have found in North America and other European uh, spaces. So for example, the idea of whiteness as virtue, um, whites are smarter people who are more rational, who are more fit to govern. And so when you're having these conversations about who becomes the citizen citizens of any society, you if, if some people are smarter and rational and more fit to govern, then by uh, implication, they are more fit to be citizens. Um, but also you begin to see the other groups, the out groups as a burden. So blacks, Asians, Indians, mixed race people, but also the native indigenous people um, and, and seeing them as uh, threats to civilization. In fact, this, you know, if you, if you sort of think about racial attitudes in the US that have um, often persisted, you see these, um, these ideas. And so it, it's an interesting time and in question of new hierarchies, new um, ways of organizing society, but ways that are still uh, determined by the history of these nations. And so we think about the previous hierarchies of the Catholic Church, the king, um, and maybe the commoners being now changed and dominated by new political elites, by businesses, by, but, but this still kind of refer to the individual um, and, and their place in society. Um, so, in, and some of these were probably more ridiculous than we, so the idea that uh, old Christians with a lineage from Spain were closer to God, um, yeah, it, that that was not. Um, but so when when you actually think about uh, this differentiation, these um, um, these systems of exclusion, they were rooted in religion. So um, and we, we I do not want to sorry going to the whole the curse of Ham um, arguments, but um, the idea that Ham was cursed because and and his his uh, offspring because he saw his father naked and you know so then that he, somehow his descendants became black and so on and so you, you see this this the persistence of racial attitudes but also there were attitudes about members of society and so for example um the the perception of men versus women and so men being seen as aggressive sexual public beings and being in the public sphere, women being seen as passive, chaste, private, and in the domain, 
of the home and we talked about this um, including how women were excluded uh, during the wars of independence despite their significant contributions to um, and so when when we sort of think about the end of colonization and the new nations that are being born so the racial hierarchies that that saw africans um, being enslaved and misused were not independence didn't remove them and so these are reinvigorated and um, yeah so you you sort of see the exclusions continuing um, and so when we sort of think about the new culture that emerges in these countries we see civic culture being dominated by white elite males but again you know what is new that that is occasionally the same case in the u.s in other places um, but we also see so we see masculinity in latin america as being we briefly talked about machismo and and we are not probably going to talk about it much more but this is what we're inferring so women who entered public sphere are seen as you know unusual and um, maybe they are out of their depth they are pathologized they are seen as dishonorable because they are now if if you think about this in the 20th century the question is or well, the 21st century how can we justify this um is this gendering people <clears throat> women and their contribution and so these hierarchies the, the the tragedies of these hierarchies existing not just in latin america but also if you think about parallels with other places north america women not being able to vote and you know sort of being seen as including in the 1920s like their place was in the home um and so it you know there were those who were gendered and re and, and confined to the home but also the the hierarchies that excluded ex uh, that that uh, justified exclusion from public life also included blacks and you know other minorities that were seen as racially unworthy and so you have lots of examples of this so for example regular workers most merchants the uh, mestizo peddlers um all seen as racially pure or um, publicly desirable so the uh, elite white males especially dominated public life they made some assumptions so for example if you think about the views their views of uh, indigenous women um, they, they were seen as workers not as contributors to the uh, democratic or the, the national project and so they especially the indigenous women and mixed race seem to be open to sexual advances and insufficiently chaste and so it's it's almost like this underclass of um of individuals who are created by the hierarchies of the latin american nations but we also see assumptions about their morals um and and so the the suspicion the and, and i sort of think of this as you know you fit the description of the suspect um it's nothing you did it it was probably the color of your skin that you know uh, produced this but also we see and and i i think this occurs or ha has at least occurred uh, perhaps in the u.s if you sort of think about uh, loving the virginia this is probably what we are talking about so when we think about class hierarchies and how they are reproduced and how they are preserved but also how sometimes they are breached and so for example the greatest prize for a mestizo male was a wife who was whiter than himself so it's you know degrees of whiteness uh, because this guaranteed her virtue and better future for his children perhaps we have to think about that wife who was whiter than the man she married and whether she suffered social um, degradation because of that choice that she made um, and so we see some of these countries embarking on very unusual um, things so for example race improvement projects um, and the justification of race improvement projects was the idea that um, society's troubles were due to racial makeups and so if you had less of the troublesome people naturally you'd have societies and so 
a lot of the Latin American elites um, undertook projects to improve races. Um, and so, for example, one of the projects was to erase the stain of blackness or Indianness. <clears throat> and so this could be achieved. I, I'm not sure exactly how much this was achieved uh, through intermarriage and reclassification. So the offspring would be um, different. Argentina did this very uh, blatantly. And so if you look at the uh, population of blacks in Argentina, so Afro-Argentines were 25% of Buenos Aires population in 1838, and this declined to 2% in 1887. And you're not saying all these people died or moved or uh, most of it was uh, due to reclassification as trigueno or wheat colored. And so wheat colored is not exactly black. Wheat is brown, I think. Um, and so you, you can sort of see now being able to say, well, we really don't have many black people. Um, and so these trigüenos were, you know, were improved, and I say this with air quotes, uh, through or, you know, were redeemed through education, modernization, hygiene, nutrition, uh, health in motherhood, and other improvements. And then, you know, it's not there's there's still other societal discriminations that make this even more challenging so for example if you don't have the same opportunities to work in um, the high society or maybe the higher end um, establishments how can you improve your education and modernize and how can you do those things that make you that redeem you um, and so this reclassification was primarily based on the idea that uh, they could elevate the poor into civilization and therefore societies would prosper. And so if you actually think about these ideas, they're the same ideas that undergird, um, undergird colonialism, the, the idea that you're going to improve people, um, civilize them and, and so on. And so when you sort of think about the, um, the, the sources of these views, um, they, they were not necessarily egalitarian. It's not the belief in equality of people, because again, if you, you sort of think about the, the, the classifications, classifications inherently suggest difference. Um, and so these are uh, grounded in Catholic paternalism. Um, they, the religious imperative to Christianize and civilize people um, help the defenseless, pathetic people. Um, and so you, you, you kind of see how this is um, applied. Now, so of course, this is um, maybe part of the darker view of the racial divide, but also uh, thinking about how some of the nationalist symbols like you're using the society to advance your but you don't include them um in um in um the the national project or you you see them as other and less than and so for example in peru you see the uh, active indians being actively despised um and so sort of building these hierarchies and, and differences. So for example, Imenos and Highlanders, so the people who lived in the maybe the black, the, the wheat colored people who um, were part of societies, but also lived in areas where there, were, there had been a lot of um, farming activity, plantations, so growing these cash crops before independence and um, emancipation and and so when you sort of think about these divisions and this actually evokes the um, the vision of South Africa so you have a white mestizo city a, a coast that was dominated by the Indian highlands in a countryside um, and so you you have sort of different constituencies within the same nation um, and so you have control of the highlands by merchants and landlords um, and uh, the Limenos who were male native residents of Lima. Um, Lima is the capital of Peru, you know, who 
who who kind of are in this mix and sort of still trying to determine what's their place in the uh, new society. And so if we move up north and I think about uh, Mexico and Argentina, the, the race challenges or the race geographies were less well defined. And so it's, if you sort of think about the difference between Mexico's um, more urban regions versus like the Yucatan Peninsula where there were more um, of the native populations um, and also Argentina's Pampas which was kind of the wild wild west of Argentina with people of questionable uh, background like the gauchos and other people who are doing you know lots of uh, the work in, in those um, areas and so you you sort of think about how the nations the new nations are dealing with these um, I, I hesitate to call them outsiders, but it's um, individuals who are not central to society as it is being um, developed. And so think about um, the, the work of these uh, natives, but also um, other populations like the newly um, liberated Africans. And, and so sort of what when you're in those particular groups, what is your place in this society and how much sympathy can you expect uh, from uh, from from the, the state? And so, for example, in Mexico, now we, we haven't talked about uh, Porfirio Diaz. We, we mentioned him. Um, he was president for many years, um, four times. And so some of the projects that the governments will undertake you know, they, they say they are improving or freeing up territory that is being underutilized by, um, you know, native populations. And this kind of evokes the, the colonial idea of um, terra nullis. Like, you know, nobody lives there, so we're just going to move people. But also, like, Mexico just moves um, 15,000 uh, Yaquis from their homes in Sonora, which is in the south of Mexico, and moved them to um, labor plantations in the Yucatan Peninsula. And so you you see these these things that are done, and, and you, you actually see parallels. So think about the Trail of Tears, Andrew Jackson moving uh, Native Americans um, west of Mississippi. And so you see this in Argentina with uh, Julio Roca, uh, conquers, well, conquers the desert, but you know, what is the story of the people who are conquered? Um, so Mexico does this, uh, Argentina does this, and so part of what they are doing is to open the new territory for um, settlement and speculation by um, investors who most typically happen to be um, of European origin, so it's almost like you're moving the natives, so you can create space for the um, for the new settlers, and you know. So again, we we may look at other countries and say, "Well, you moved all your people, and that was terrible." But you know, they are opening the you know Argentina, Mexico, the U.S. are opening new territory for white speculators and settlers so that they can become productive. And these were some of the same arguments that were made in colonialism that, you know, you have all this territory land and, and people are not using it productively. Um, and so the indigenous people themselves actually do find uh, significant challenges. And some of these challenges are around um, what kinds of changes they need to make. Like, how do they how do they adapt to these uh, changes? Um, what direction do they take? Their lands were taken by the colonial Spanish authorities and now these new independent people who have probably less regard for them. Um, and so they, you, you do see appropriation of the language of liberalism in the demand of rights as citizens, but they also participated in national wars, perhaps occasionally or most of the time to try and improve their place in society. Um, 
And so they they do these things, they fight in Mexican army. So for example, the Mexican, uh, the French, French invasion of Mexico um, that ends up in the killing of uh, Emperor Maximilian. But they, they do not find broad acceptance. Um, and, and we do find this a lot in in this newly formed nation. So if you sort of think about when um, the, the U.S. became, or rather when uh, Native Americans in the U.S. became citizens, this kind of gives you an idea of, of the treatment of um, Native um, Americans. And so when you, when you sort of think about these countries that become independent, and, you know, again, maybe borrowing from Enlightenment and some of its uh, major failures, you see that liberal elites were not inclined to recognize other races. Now, again, remember there's a whole bunch of like 40 different classifications and some of them are based on race. Um, and, and so it's almost like a project to remake the nation and have the right people in the nation. So you're erasing memory of uh, minorities um, and, and so it's, it's almost like they are going into the darkness, if you remember the, the, that um, image by um, the uh, um, American Westward Expansion, Columbia uh, expanding. And so, again, there's still a fight for village autonomy, but also a question of how to participate in the new government. Um, it was particularly important for these populations to keep their rights to their land and set their own laws and live free of interference with the outside world. But now they are subsumed within this larger space that is the nation. And so you have to think about um, their place given those conditions and how the elites do see them and elites of them the, as fodder for their dreams, but they also saw them as being in the way of uh, progress. And so um, it, you're going to see a lot of um, a lot of breaking up of these, um, you know, small communal peasant villages, most of the time that are, that were formed by indigenous peoples, because that was their lifestyle. And so um, when the liberal state, the independent state, comes into being. Part of what it does is uh, break up the um, the communal peasant villages. Um, even though, for example, they had had um, a positive relationship with the colonial authorities, sometimes when you are the new regime, you want to break with the old regime, including, you know, uh, broken, broken, breaking up the uh, communal and peasant villages. So. This became part of the, um, and so, but also think about other maybe non-local um, e events, even though they have a local flavor. So after the Industrial Revolution of the 1800s, we see life expectancy increasing. Now what life expectancy does is it produces more people. And so how are you going to cater for these more people. You, you need land, you need um, you need farmland to graze things, um, to produce crops and so on. And so you, you see a lot of land grabbing, land being gobbled uh, up. And so again, we start new this idea, like you go into Oklahoma and other places, you know, like nobody has title to this land. So it's probably not owned by anyone, even though the ownership, um, like communal ownership um, strategies and ideas and practices continue. Um, but land surveyors, speculators, investors, they, you know, they just take up this land and they establish title to it. And because for the most part, government is on their side, uh, you find that these indigenous populations really have no recourse. Um, so, so this is part of what we are seeing with the uh, with the indigenous peoples. Now, again, when you sort of think about the loss of land, what are the the peasants going to do? They have to work in the labor market, export agriculture. Uh, sometimes, you know, you you are working 
you you you're working off your wages which are not enough and so you know again this this a lot of displacement um the grievances are there they have continued in some places like uh, brazil you actually see uh, the previous few years the government really almost trying to erase these um individuals it's um it's not fasc it's fascinating to see but not in a good way um, and so with this population growth and independence we see the emergence of new mestizo um, majorities but also we see the regionalism um, so mestizos when, when you sort of think about the the uh, mixed parentage of uh, some of these individuals we we see the distance to um, ancestry and so this this becomes um, important but the, we have to also think about what the initial independence sort of uh, thought about citizenship even for these mestizos were they did they think about equality were they equal and in in some instances yes but but again i want you to sort of think about uh racism and it's maybe dual nature um institutional racism but also maybe um the the more pernicious and hidden uh insidious racism that is maybe interpersonal you know so for example um your house being valued lower because you are certain um your certain ethnic persuasion so these are not necessarily institutional even though you might think about the institutional money lenders and and so on but so this social hierarchy is hardened even as the population divides decrease through these reclassifications and other things um and and so we we so when when you sort of think about these uh ratio and social hierarchies they you know they, they become part of the new um nation so even though the new the the um maybe general populations were the the maybe new the older well i'm trying to figure out a good way to sort of think about the um the indigenous and older racial groups um are beginning to diminish but the new social elites are recreating these um divisions and so we actually see some um some acceptance of uh mestizos and mulattoes in polite societies but they they really couldn't uh thrive that much so it's it's not it's that whole you know pull yourself up by bootstraps but can you really succeed in those kinds of um environment um so when we think about those new racial hierarchies they reproduce the old divisions now we probably need to um also think about the sustain and the persistence of um, slavery and some of the um sort of republics that it produced or the uh, conditions that it when we think about the the totality of the slavery experience and of course it's it's you know slavery was um 300 almost 400 year affair so it's difficult to actually just you know capture all of what happened during slavery but we sort of have to think about the the stain and the persistence of slavery in latin america in the caribbean but also sometimes in the u.s like you know slavery however we want to not talk about a crt infuses uh, most of our experiences and existence but so enslaved people were the first to create a, a, a republic in the caribbean and so when you think about san domingue or haiti this became the first country and of course you have to think about what other countries in the region thought um you know um it would almost take the u.s um significant period of time maybe half a century to achieve emancipation so 
1865. Um, but the story of freedom and citizenship was, uh, it, it did vary across the Americas. Um, some places had long discussions about who could be a citizen and, and whether black people were properly oriented or black people and other minorities were pro properly oriented towards becoming um, citizens. Um, and so the local histories and cultures and circumstances did impact citizenship uh, broadly in the region. Um, thinking about where emancipation was easily achieved versus where um, it took longer. But from the Chesapeake Bay down to um, probably not Argentina, but Brazil, slavery was fundamental to colonial life. It, it really built the antebellum period of um, social economic development in those relations. Um, and so ending slavery in necessarily meant ending or existing the social order, but also the, the discussions towards ending slavery are actually occurring at a period of time when the bigger debates are about eugenics and how people are different and maybe not perhaps why we should oppress, well, I say we like I was part of it, but why society should not oppress or should oppress uh, certain people, so deny them rights. And so the, the outcomes of slavery, um, the stain of slavery continued, continues, uh, but also there were these fears of how do we end slavery? And it's been a feature of life for almost three hundred, not, not just life, but also um, of economic many years and you know so this this was um, a major consideration in the debates when we sort of think about latin america we we ought to think about uh, the proximity of slavery to independence uh, but also the the difference for example with um the united states north america uh, independence came before well, actually during slavery and it's probably rare to find um, that there were enslaved people in George Washington's army who would eventually gain freedom because of that, uh, but also the, the persistent attitudes. And so in, in Latin America, the, the enslaved had an opportunity to take part in their own freedom, um, not so in, the, um, in Latin America. But also, so when we sort of think about um, the commonality of um, slavery in Latin American region, we want to think about, for example, the Spanish vice royalties. So 30,000 in La Plata, 70,000 in New Granada, uh, 64,500 in Venezuela, and 89,000 in Peru. But also some of these populations would eventually grow. So think about Spain and Uruguay and some of the numbers that, that we see here of the individuals that they either transported or um, embarked in the new world um, and where they worked, um, the conditions under which they worked, including, for example, working alongside uh, free peoples. Now, ar across the different countries, they worked on um, different types of enterprises, like in Peru, sugar plantations and uh, vineyards, in Venezuela, cacao and sugar estates, in Colombian gold mines and in cattle ranches in Argentina alongside gauchos and um, other um, groups. Now, so slavery here often resembled the whole spectrum of the American South, but also like the Arabian Peninsula where people could be fully or semi-enslaved and worked as servants and skilled and unskilled workers, often next to free workers, uh, free laborers. And so they were not as critical a source of labor as they were in the agricultural antebellum South. Um, but when you think about the, the plantation agriculture in the Caribbean, so San Domingue um, and um, 
people should become Haiti and uh, the Dominican Republic, they there was a heavy reliance on slavery for uh, existence. And so, for example, in Brazil, with gold and diamond mining, but also the imagined coffee economy in Sao Paulo and other regions. So when we sort of think about slavery in Latin America, um, the, the, a lot of importation, <clears throat> and you can see this from the numbers, went to like Brazil had almost half of the year. And so you, you actually had um, a lot of enslaved people who were one generation removed from Africa, but in the US, particularly after 1807 and the um, declaration of the abolishment of slavery, most people were eventually native born, um, most enslaved people. Now, of course, we, we have talked about the free womb laws, which would make uh, children of, of enslaved people free born. But this did not exist in places like the US. So when you think about the one uh, drop of blood rule, one drop rule, um, this kept a lot of um, people <clears throat> from being considered uh, free or from pursuing their freedom. And so when, when we sort of think about the the differences between North America and South America. Uh, North America imported <clears throat> between 500,000 and 1%, 1 million of um, the enslaved Africans, which came to about less than 5% of the um, total. And so some of the questions revolve around the uh, historical cost, uh, poverty of US plantation societies, and length of time importing Africans. So, for example, um, slavery was abolished formally in Brazil in 1860s. And if you actually look at the uh, numbers of um, Africans imported to Cuba in, um, in like between 1860s, 1860s before the Ten Years' War, um, there were quite a number of, um, in, in fact, it's almost a tenth maybe of uh, the the population of Africans that was in, that was imported, or that was um, eventually imported into North America. Now, <clears throat> paradoxically, in the nineteenth century, the U.S. enslaved population was the largest um, because you know natural birth um, or natural increase in birth, low levels of manumission, so people stayed slaves, but also. The, the the one drop rule kept more people enslaved or in conditions of slavery where they could have probably um, obtained freedom. Uh, but also, if you think about miscegenation, so sexual relationships or produ reproduction between people of different ethnic groups, especially when one of them is white, perfect example would be Thomas Jefferson um, and his lady companion, I forget her name, but these relationships did not produce free peoples. And so um, a lot of those children, even when they survived, um, when they were born, were born into slavery and would become slaves um, themselves. So eventually you see the natural progression of the uh, population. And by the time um, the civil war in the U.S. is fought in 1861 to 65, I believe there were about five million um, Africans who were enslaved, so, you know, being freed by the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, now, so again, as we mentioned, the European ancestry persons just ignored um, the, the idea of, um, you know, miscegenation or, um, I, I, I like to think of it as multiracial individuals. And so even if you had some European ancestry, this didn't really help you because, you know, you, you one draw pro. Um, but also the, the thing about North America and, and when you talk about race and the new independence in Latin America, we, we kind of have to think about um, race and eugenics. And so being a free person, even manumissioned or, you know, freed through the Underground Railroad, do not necessarily mean that your circumstances were better than 
maybe those of other people in other in so enslaved people of course had it horrible uh, but most blacks also prohibited from other things like becoming preachers, selling certain goods, standing bars. We saw in Mexico, the um, local population was not allowed to grow grapes, which makes no sense because you can eat grapes as much as you can make wine with them. And so they, you're not necessarily competing. But they couldn't tend bars. They couldn't stay out uh, past a certain time of night. And I'm sure you probably have heard of, hopefully not familiar with, uh, um, sun, sundown, sunset towns, uh, but also in this I find to be particularly maybe insulting. They could not own dogs, and um, it's like there were some of these rules, and you're like, why can't black people own dogs? Now my personal philo thinking is that maybe it's because dogs were also used to hunt escaped prisoners, so maybe that was the reason why. Um, but so again, we can say that the North American um, individuals of black origin, whether free or slave, had many restrictions on them. Now, Haiti, as we have previously mentioned, and which is currently, as of this moment, going through um, significant challenges, its history was different. And so when you sort of think about the um, total importation of um, Africans, and, numbers that approach a million um, but also the booming sugar complex um, sh sugar plantation complexes and planting and, and so on and at some point it contributed 50 percent of the um, <coughs> uh, world's sugar so it was really um, but uh, the, with Haiti there was so if you think about the population of Haiti for example in 18 maybe of oh, Four before independence, um, about half a million enslaved Africans, 30,000 mulattoes and 30,000 white Frenchmen. And so they, there was um, sort of like three different groups in Haiti. Uh, but we also find that um, even mulattoes and other individuals did have, um, did hold wealth. And so for example, if you think about the Haitian Revolution of 1791 that was fomented by Vincent Ogi after he saw the French Revolution in France. Um, he was a mulatto and, and they owned plantations, but part of what he was agitating for was that he did not, they did not have um, the franchise, the right to vote. And so when we sort of think about Haiti, we, we see maybe the, um, the role that slavery played in independence because it's the slaves who rose up and, you know, um, overthrew their overlords. Um, but also very interestingly, occasionally free blacks were occasionally owners of slaves. So it, it really wasn't necessary. You can't just say it's a, it's a white thing enslaving it's 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 a capitalism and white and some black thing um and so sometimes they did not support emancipation because if you own um enslaved people you want them to work for you and what happens if you actually let them go um and so you, examples are given so for example uh to San Lovacha wanted to con compare the enslavement um, after the, the French Revolution freed or enslaved people. And, you know, the argument was actually economic and maybe capitalist because he thought that the sugar industry would collapse and individuals would start, you know, hiving off small pieces of land, which was not maybe good for, um, uh, for plantation type of production. But, you know, maybe he didn't ask from only enslaved black people what they wanted. Uh, but there was also instances of um, a genuine belief in the liberal cause um, and also participation of African-Americans and black people in military independence movement activities so that they could um, actually become independent. Now, let's turn to another part of this um, region that so 
Cuban. So when we sort of think about the the Cuban economy, slavery was completely essential to um, its economy, particularly when uh, Haiti collapsed or the sugar industry collapsed with independence in 1804. Um, and so it's sort of like people are shifting to more sugar growing in Cuba, which kind of makes sense. Now, Cuban planters were more supportive of um, the group more sugar cane imported more people and this maintained Cuba's colonial status. These are not necessarily good things that, that you're importing more people um, as a colony, you're growing more sugar cane using coerced labor. Uh, but also when we sort of think about the, the growth in nations, North America be is becoming more important and Spain at this point is losing colonies uh, because of independence uh, in the Western Hemisphere. And so when we sort of think about the Cuban um, economy and the, po <coughs> excuse me, the population, we see that um, the uh, Cuban population is more diverse with higher European um, migration. And like we saw in Argentina, there was um, a higher, there was a promotion of higher migration um, into Cuba. But so we also need to think about what was happening in the region during this period. So the, um, the abolition of the slave trade led to the British and the Americans patrolling uh, the Atlantic, especially near West Africa, where the ships um, disembarked and disembarked or uh, started out their, their journeys. And so it became more challenging to maybe grow um, sugar in or to import slaves, um, basically. Um, so, you, you know, there's, there's, there's this pressure to end slave trade. Uh, but then Cuba does another thing, which the US also kind of did at some point, which is importation of indentured Chinese laborers, so indentured laborers, you, you are committed to a certain period of time to work for um, whatever you're indentured towards. Uh, but again, you, you see Cuba really doing a number on importation of um, Africans, so 400,000 within a period of about 30 years. Um, if you kind of think about the numbers on that, it's I mean, it's it's thirty years and four hundred thousand, so forty thousand in in divided by three, it's um, about fourteen point something. So fourteen thousand Africans were getting through the the, the so-called blockade that the U.S. and uh, the British um, employed to stop um, to stop uh, the slave trade. But you know, so again not very successful. So the Cuban economy um, was a challenge um, in, in terms of promoting the slave trade. So for example, you see more free blacks were enriched through the slave um, economy. But we also see black people joining many different uh, professions. So they, they are also petty merchants and this allows them to generate wealth that also produces upward mobility. But this also leaves out the poor blacks out of prosperity. And so when we, the, the government in response tightened the case restrictions, limited movement of people of color. Again, these are the tactics that uh, many colonial powers used in places where they had colonies. Uh, but what do you do with um, individuals who are already there? So you kind of have to but also what do the people, how does it affect the people who are there? And so we see it being harder for free blacks to uh, move up the social ladder, but we also have to keep in mind um, Haiti, Saint-Domingue, and what happened uh, with, the, um, with the uprising that toppled the French and mulatto um, oligarchies and leadership and created a free state. And so Cuba had these same uh, fears. Um, and so 
the royal officials actually began a campaign against the free blacks in uh, 1844, arrest 2000, exiled many of them, um, but also used the same kind of language in painting black people as threats, as um, not possibly good citizens and you know, so all these kinds of negative uh, variables applied to them. So this is Cuba. We need to think about the country that received the most um, the most enslaved people. And so when we sort of think about Brazil, what was the difference in Brazil? Um, it became independent in 1888. Um, it, well, actually, no. It became independent in 1822, I think, uh, Dom Pedro II. But we have to think about what does independence mean. And in this case, it kind of meant the same thing it meant for African Americans. The U.S. was independent, but that didn't mean they were, the um, Africans were free. And so we actually see colonial restrictions being... Um, loosely uh, losing progressively, but in the slave trade really did create a significant Afro-Brazilian population. Um, and so the difference in Brazil is actually that for the first time and first place, um, where colonialism had thrived and, and well, not colonialism, well, both colonialism and slavery had thrived. Um, you you actually see libertos or formerly enslaved people having the franchise. Uh, but like the U.S., they were required to meet property qualifications, so you had to have property. But we also find non-whites across the professions, government, intelligentsia, and so on. Um, and so for Brazil, there was less of a formal and more of an informal um, prohibitions and so sort of when we talked about uh, hidden racism, this is kind of what was there in Brazil. Now, of course, really Brazil is famous for um, other um, social ills that plague it. So, for example, um, colorism. And so, again, it's this is almost like one of those relics of the caste system, like, you know, how dark you are might determine what kind of... Uh, you have. And so when we sort of think about the um, the end of the slave trade, so th these countries have become independent. Um, in some of them, slave trade is still going on. In some of them, the social reorganization is going on. Uh, but for example, for Brazil and Cuba, slave trade didn't end until almost like the 1880s. And so, but, but this was partly due to international pressure, but also uh, modes of production, including, for example, mechanization. And so we, we see slavery left in the rural areas tied to export commodities. So for example, cotton, coffee, and sugar in the US, Brazil, and Cuba respectively. And so you didn't really see it in cities, but also think about industrialization and how industrialization was increasing the um, amounts of goods that were available without using human labor. And so this is a good thing for um, enlightenment. But so you see many Cubans um, agitating for freedom from Spain um, and from slavery. And so these two dual uh, contesting, contested issues. So uh, slavery and um, independence were present in uh, Spain. But so we actually begin to see um, agitation for independence from uh, both elites and um, the locals. And so we sort of think about the, the broader, maybe um, supplemental activities towards um, independence and emancipation and so on. And so we see actually enslaved and former slaves active in liberation, in hiding runaways and participating in re 
in slave revolts, so for example, uh, creating the um, the maroon communities of um, I'm thinking of this place in the Dutch in the Netherlands, maybe. Um, but so we also see the, the formation of uh, social organizations which raise funds to purchase freedom, um, the existence of an underground star telegraph, even Toki West and Islands, so it might be actually easy to catch people if you can patrol the coast. Um, laws that challenges, that challenged overseers, um, the disenfranchisement that continue to bring about revolts, but also thinking about uh, the agency towards liberation, we want to look at the Haitian Revolution and what it did in terms of um, encouraging Marines and so on. Um, and so Cuba actually becomes one of the last countries to abolish uh, slavery, and it has to go through a 10 years war uh, from 1860 to 1870. Now, what is actually interesting is that the uh, person who comes up with the, uh, who is credited with um, beginning the process of Cuban independence was himself, uh, I believe, a, a plantation owner. Um, and so, yeah, so when we sort of think about um, the 10 years war, it was important in Cuba's uh, fight for independence. Uh, but Cuba kind of resisted all the pressures as we've seen they were importing more people um, than the British, well, the, the American, well, what would become the 13 colonies did. Um, definitely in a similar period of time, but also almost uh, the same uh, number of people over the um, maybe 300 years. So this was important. And so this 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 a bit of information on the 10 years war, which was also called the uh, Great War or War of 68. Um, and so Carlos Manuel de Spain frees the slaves and his slaves and then declares uh, Cuban independence um, in one of those uh, cries that we have talked about, um, cry of the colonizers. Um, and so the, the process, yeah, he issued Grito de Yara or Cry of the Yara. And so the, Cuba's independence and in, uh, emancipation is really tied to the 10 war, 10 year war um, and, and part of the challenges and some of the arguments is international slavery has ended while we're still doing this. Um, and so it was literally only Cuba and Brazil as some of the last places where slavery was uh, legal and the need to import because of the uh, low um, reproduction rates because of conditions and you know, other challenges. Uh, but so we see more indentured labor being brought into Brazil, um, but also the realization that slavery was becoming increasingly unworkable. Um, and so we, we see the 10 years war as being very uh, instrumental in the, um, in the end of the, uh, of slavery. Now in, um, 1870, the Moret War was, uh, Moret Law was passed, which was uh, passed during the Ten Years War. And this law declared that all individuals born on the island henceforth would be free, even though it required a 22 year apprenticeship from children born of enslaved mothers. So it's almost like you, you're free, but there are these conditions. Um, but also, there was major pressure of abolition, abolitionists to reject the law. Um, the Spanish Parliament passed a law which called for uh, another a law, I believe, that called for gradual abil uh, abolition, but so included an eight, not 22 year uh, period for former enslaved persons. But of course, this was also challenged by 
the uh, patronato to remove the uh, limits on freedom and so the law was abolished two years later um, with slavery ending on uh, in 1886. Now this gives us some idea of or maybe a reminder of when the different countries passed laws that um, eradicated slavery or in some form or other fashion um, ended slavery within their territories and borders. We shall think, I think, stop here for the present. Uh, we shall 